Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Artificial Intelligence and Academic Integrity Parent Care Information Evening. My name is Tristan Berg. I'm the Acting Assistant Principal of Academic Care. And I'm joined tonight by Lachlan McNichol, the Principal, Mrs. Maria O'Donnell, who's the Campus Head of St Peter's, and our Digital Learning Coordinator, Trent Wilson, is going to be joining us via recorded video tonight as well. Tonight we'll be talking about a few things. First of all, what artificial intelligence or AI is and some common AI tools used in education. We're looking at artificial intelligence and academic integrity in a school setting. We're looking at what techniques we have to monitor students' AI use. We're looking at McKillop's strategy to maintain academic integrity in assessment tasks. And finally, McKillop's future focus in AI before we have some q and I'd like to invite Mrs O'Donnell to the stage for the acknowledgement of country. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. St Mary of the Cross MacKillop made the statement, we are but travellers here. So while we are here, we should do as much good as we can and live in peace with each other. With this in mind, the college respectfully acknowledges the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians and first people of the land on which we are meeting on tonight. The college also pays its respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples living and working in the McKillop community. As today is the Feast of the Assumption, we will say this prayer together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Mary, Mother of love. We stand before you with our joys, our desires to love and to be loved. Here we are with the weight of our days, with our miseries, our violence and our wars. But love is stronger than all. We believe that it still exists for love comes from God. We pray to you, May our homes be filled with simple gestures of brotherhood and kindness, of trust, goodwill and generosity. May families and nations be open to sharing, forgiveness and reconciliation. Mother of love, intercede for the human family. Support the efforts of those who work for justice and peace. Grant us the grace to be faithful to the gospel and to bear fruit that endures. Our Lady of Assumption, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, for coming tonight. I just wanted to introduce the evening briefly and uh, first of all acknowledge the work of Tristan Berg and Trent Wilson who have really led the uh, response of the college uh, over the course of this year in response to the challenges that uh, come with artificial intelligence in managing assessment tasks for our students. Assessment is a key uh, element of education in a secondary school setting. It's how we can determine what students know, what they understand and the skills that they can perform. Students have always accessed a range of resources to assist them with their assessment tasks. Um, research, um, accessing information from other places, and artificial intelligence no doubt will play a part of, in that space into the future. But what is really important for us is to maintain that in assessment there is a level playing field so that we know that when students are being assessed that it is fair and equitable for all students. We know that some students perform well in different types of assessment tasks and so we want to maintain different type of assessment tasks for our students. Examinations are important, in-class assessment is important and also the opportunity for students to go home, to take tasks home, to take time without a pressing deadline of an hour or an hour and a half for an exam, to research, to put their thoughts into their tasks so that we can get a good understanding of what they do know and what they do understand. So that's really important. We don't want to take away that type of assessments from our students uh, because of the challenges that artificial intelligence pose with us there. Tristan and Trent have done a lot of work over the course of this year. Uh, They've provided a wealth of information for our students about artificial intelligence, 
about how we can use that effectively, but also about valuing our own thoughts um, and our own approach to assessment tasks, that we are getting a sense of each student in what they do. So tonight is an opportunity to talk to you. I know that Tristan has put a number of newsletter articles uh, in the newsletter over recent months about how we are managing artificial intelligence. And we wanted to have this opportunity to have a conversation with you, to share information with you about what we're doing, what we're talking to our students about, um, and help you so that you can be a part of the, the approach to managing that with your students or your children and our students. Um, Tristan and Trent are, are really leading in this space not just at McKillop but across the ACT and I can say that with a sense of authority because that's what uh, the ACT Board of Senior Secondary Studies have fed back to us. That organisation oversees secondary studies across the ACT um, and they've really been affirming of the work that Trent and Tristan have been doing um, with, with us here at McKillop. So I'm, uh, I'll pass over to, uh, to Dr Berg, Tristan. Um, Trent can't be with us in person tonight but I think he has made a recording and so we'll get to hear from him also. So thank you, Tristan. Thank you, Lachlan. Yes, Mr. Wilson has put together a little video for us about the introduction to AI, so I'll put that on the screen for us now. Artificial intelligence, or AI, refers to the ability of a machine to perform the cognitive functions we usually associate with human minds, such as perceiving, reasoning, learning, interacting with an environment, problem solving, and even exercising creativity. We have been already interacting with AI for years, such as with voice assistants like Siri and Alexa, Face ID on smartphones, and customer service chatbots that pop up to help us navigate websites. Generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence technology that can produce various types of content, including text, imagery, audio, and synthetic data in response to prompts. AI generative text has, in recent months, generated a lot of buzz and attention with the release of programs such as ChatGPT, which can create coherent and contextually relevant text, much like human writers. A significant shift recently has been the availability and accessibility of a type of generative AI called a large language model. This is a type of algorithm that processes vast amounts of text to provide written responses to prompts in a human-like fashion. Large language models are why people are worried about authorship and plagiarism. AI tools like ChatGPT and Bing AI can be used to generate sensible, literate answers to questions. And because these answers are generated, not copied, it is very hard for educators to pick up when students are presenting AI-generated content as their own. We'll quickly have a look at some examples of these in case you aren't familiar. The first is Quillbot. Quillbot is a program that many students are familiar with. It allows a user to enter text, which it will then paraphrase in original language. So here is an example of how it could be used. If I wanted to copy some information about the causes of World War I from somewhere online, I could go to the Wikipedia article, I could copy a paragraph and then go to Quillbot and paste it. When I click paraphrase, it will paraphrase this information in original text. It's as simple as that. ChatGPT has perhaps become most well known in this space since its launch late last year. It can generate original written content based on prompts you provide it. For example, if I needed to write an essay about the causes of World War I, all I would need to do is enter a prompt stating exactly what I wanted it to do for me.
Then when I press enter, it'll generate a response. Now, one thing that you can do with ChatGPT is ask it to improve its response to you by typing in follow-up or clarifying prompts. So in this example, if I actually wanted this to be written like an essay in a paragraph structure without subheadings, I can then ask ChatGPT to change and improve what it generated for me the first time. And there's a variety of things that I could ask it to do. For instance, I could ask it to write the essay as though it is a particular student in a year group. So if I wanted to write it as, I, as though I was a year nine student, I could ask it to do that. I could even ask it to make some mistakes like spelling or punctuation mistakes to make it seem more human-like in its response. The third example we'll look at is Grammarly. Grammarly is an online writing assistant that is a helpful tool for identifying grammar, punctuation, spelling, and sentence structure issues. A recent addition to its features has been Grammarly Go, which produces AI generative text like ChatGPT. So on this window, you'll see that there is the icon for Grammarly Go on the right hand side. It is really accessible for any user of Grammarly. I can then insert a prompt just like with ChatGPT and it will generate a response based on that prompt. So this goes to show just how accessible generative AI has now become. Students being exposed to AI through search engines and even social media. So Snapchat even has a feature called My AI, which has generative text from it. These features are only going to become more accessible to people in future. As Mr. Wilson demonstrated so well, AI is new, it's stunning in its capabilities, it raises many questions, it offers many opportunities, and education is right in the middle of this change. But without careful management, it also offers up a threat to one of the things we hold most dear in education, and that's academic integrity. Academic integrity, as it says on the slide, is related to a student's work being genuine and original, completed according to rules, policies, and guidelines. As a school, we report on student capabilities to the community and to government bodies. So maintaining academic integrity is a responsibility we take seriously to ensure a fair and level playing field for all. And it's especially important in year 11 and 12, as the BSSS Riley take a very strong stance on academic integrity, breaches of which are considered plagiarism. And they make it very clear, as you can see by their wording on these slides, that they consider any work written or paraphrased by others on behalf of the student including that written by AI, as plagiarism. A breach of that in school has serious academic consequences, and in the academic world, that can have serious implications. So, on a very basic regulatory level, we need to take risks to academic integrity where AI work is presented as student work very seriously. We need to make sure that what we report as student results is an honest representation of their capabilities against their peers and against the standards. But at MacKillop, there's a deeper level to why we take academic integrity so seriously. The vision and mission of the college can provide clarity in times of uncertainty, reminding us that MacKillop is a learning environment where excellence in education is valued. And for me, when it comes to education, I always fall back on the lessons of that parable of the sower, which reminds me we must prepare our students not just for temporary or apparent success, but for long-term, deep and authentic education. One of the things that stuck with me throughout my whole teaching career is something I learned when I was doing my teacher training. Education is all about learning, 
MacKillop, we're here to make sure we obtain excellence in learning and learning is a consequence of thinking. So if we're true to that vision and mission statement, valuing excellence in learning, then as a college, we must value student thinking as a focus of all we do. And as you're probably aware, MacKill is part of the Catalyst program initiated by the Canberra Goldman Catholic Education Office. And the neuroscience work that underpins that Catalyst program helps us see the value of that thinking. On a simple model of the mind, which you can see on the screen, on the far left, we have input coming into the sensory memory. And that input can be all the information, the sights, the sounds. It could be the research a student's reading or the information presenting in class. All that comes in to the working memory. In the working memory, which has a very limited capacity, maybe about five things at a time, this is where the real thinking and learning starts to take place. And because of that limited capacity, that's why initially things are always hard to do the first time, because your brain isn't prepared to handle the new complexity of a new task. However, our long-term memory is effectively limitless. And what happens in thinking and learning is that that retrieved information that's coming in from the long-term memory combines with the new information in the working memory. And when that's processed in the working memory, that's when we generate new ideas and new thoughts. And then the encoding of those new ideas and new thoughts into the long-term memory helps us grow, helps our brains grow, helps our capacities grow, helps our memory, helps our speed of recall, helps our speed of processing. Essentially, that process that's occurring in here in the encoding retrieval, that process is learning. And this is where the risk of AI comes in. If AI is being used to do that work in the brain, and all the essays, stories, code reports are being produced on the left, outside the brain, inside a computer, that means thinking is not happening. And that also means the thing we hold most dear to learning is also not occurring. So in addition to our regulatory requirements, we value academic integrity highly because at MacKillop we value learning so highly. There are no shortcuts to the thinking required that produces learning. It's not just because we've got an obligation to external bodies that we take academic integrity so seriously, it's our obligation to the students and their families and their learning. It's the core of our business. And this is where school is very different to the wider world, the outside, broader and business world. In that world, AI is being used to produce amazing new works and speed up routine processes in the interest of efficiency, getting the end product faster and getting that end product better. But that's not the purpose of school. In school, it's that careful journey to find the final product is what we value because the rigour of the academic journey is the purpose. That rigour of the academic journey is the learning the students are undertaking. School tasks, including assessment tasks, are designed for students to learn by putting effort into their thinking. The ensuing learning is the true value of student work and the focus of assessment. The academic voice that students produce, their unique style, is a window into their own thinking. And this means the use of AI generative text tools puts students at risk of misrepresenting their thinking capabilities. And when AI is used to shortcut thinking, it means they bypass that thing we value most, their learning. And at MacKillop, we're striving to build a learning environment where we support students to understand the value of that academic journey, where they value their own thinking. They value the development of their own academic voice and have the opportunity, the incentive to develop, refine and empower confidence in their own voice. But we do understand that challenge. In an AI embedded world where an essay is just one simple click of a mouse button away, we need to convince the students of the value of that work. So in addition to the stuff we've been talking about tonight, we've also raised a few other issues with students to think about of why their own work and their own learning and their own thinking and their own academic voice is valuable. And the first one that says on the screen is capability. In a world where AI tools are available to everyone, it's their unique thinking, it's their unique voice that they can bring to the world, which is going to give them the advantage to make them stand out and thrive. It's discernment. In a world where AI content is being produced at a rapid rate, it's their own learning experiences, their own knowledge and their own thinking that allow them to distinguish truth and beauty from bias and deception. And finally, unique voice. All the current AI models out there have been trained upon the writing of generations past. But the one voice that's missing from those models that they've been trained upon is the student voice, their own unique voice. So unless they challenge, foster and grow their own unique voice, they'll be denying their ability to shape the world through their ideas, inspirations and their own creations. But helping students to value their learning is only part of the puzzle to help academic integrity stand up against the risks of AI and the temptations of AI. What we needed at MacKillop was some strategies, some college-wide strategies with multiple prongs to manage this issue. Tonight so far I've been talking about how we promoted thinking and learning and academic integrity amongst the school community. I'll talk later about the mechanisms we've got that students can use to defend their own authorship, 
But first, we're going to present some slides Mr Wilson presented to show how we've worked to remove opportunity and incentive for academic misconduct by the use of AI detection tools. So at McKillop, for quite a while, we're using a tool called Turnitin, and you might be familiar with it. They use it in university settings a lot as well. Turnitin is a tool that in the past just checked submitted work, such as a student submitted assessment task, against information available on the internet. So essentially, as it shows in that example there, this was some examples of student work that was submitted, and Turnitin had matched those first two paragraphs against things already on the internet, which was an indication to the teacher that student had just copied and pasted that work into their assessment task. However, now they've added an extra part to their arsenal of checking. They've also got what's called an AI tool, which is available to teachers. And this tool doesn't check against things available on the internet, it checks against text which could have been generated by an AI bot. So like here in this situation here, this student would have got an AI tool to write that first paragraph and that's been flagged as that paragraph is 100% AI and their assessment task is 75% AI generated. Now the questions are, there are a lot of questions out there in the community, how, how reliable are these tools? And according to Turnitin's models, they're 98% effective in detecting AI. Now we did our own internal testing as well, we wanted to make sure we could trust that and we ran a whole lot of assessment tasks that teachers generated through these models, whether they were fully generated by AI, uh, first paragraph, last paragraph generated by AI. We ran models through where they used Quillbot or Grammarly Go to just modify student work. And pretty much with above 90% accuracy, the tool was allowed to detect which was AI generated and what was student generated all the time. So we're quite confident in the reliability of these tools. And just as an example, uh, Mr. Wilson put together some little videos here, which I'll talk over if I can get them to run. So this was a tool which was written, this was an essay which was written by ChatGPT, and Mr. Wilson put it through Turnitin. And as you can see, most of the assessment task at first glance, according to the basic view, doesn't have much plagiarism at all, because this, this first view is checking against information on the internet. And because this information was generated by ChatGPT, it's brand new text. However, running that same essay which was generated by ChatGPT through the teacher version of the tool shows a very different picture. So same essay running through the tool. Looking down that bottom right hand corner, we see it's picked it up as 100% AI generated. And when the teacher clicks on that, they can clearly see that even though it didn't look like it came from the web, the entire assessment task looked like it was written by an AI bot or an AI tool. So we're quite confident in its capabilities to pick up AI written work. Now we know that's going to change with time, so we've got strategies in place for that for the future, but we think this is a pretty valid way for the time being of checking student work is authentic and written with academic integrity. Uh, just as a comparative example, uh, this is an essay written by a student. So this is one which was 100% written by a human, as opposed to a bot. So we put this essay through the Turnitin tool, once again, first time through the original tool, which just checks against the internet. And as you can see, that quote has obviously come from somewhere else, which makes sense. There's a few sentences which are, are common on the internet, but on the whole, it looks like student work where they've just paraphrased a few things from the internet. And then running that same essay through the new tool, the AI detection tool. And this tool at the moment only teachers can access, not students. Students can check their original work, but they can't check the AI tool. And the AI tool's picked up at 0%. 0% likely to be written, written by an AI bot because it's written in a way that a human would produce as opposed to the way that AI tools generate text at the moment. So we're quite confident with how this works. We've done a whole lot of testing, not just on ChatGPT, but other models as well. This is an example of Quillbot. So for example, the thing on the left would have been a set of paragraphs that a student had copied and pasted from the internet. And on the right, that's what Coolbot produced when it paraphrased it. And as we know, the BSSS says that paraphrasing or having someone else, including an AI bot paraphrasing, is considered um, an academic integrity breach. And when it's been put through the Turnitin, the coloured bits show that some of it might have come from the internet, but it's very clear that whole thing had been written by an AI bot. So it was copied, pasted, and AI had tried to rewrite it, but this tool can pick up that AI had rewritten this work. So the students managed to hide the fact that they copied and pasted from the internet, but they couldn't hide the fact that they used AI to hide that fact. Uh, same thing, if I go back one more, sorry. Um, Grammarly, sorry, jumping around a little bit too much. Grammarly is a very useful and very common tool used. And we don't want students to stop using all tools altogether because this tool has been very useful for a lot of students for a lot of reasons. 
And so what Mr Wilson's put together is this guide for students when you're putting yourself at risk, when you're putting yourself at danger, and what's safe to use. Because there are a whole lot of parts of grammar which are very good for students to use. Spell checking, uh, grammar checking, punctuation checking. But it's when you actually start getting Grammarly to write words for you, essentially putting words into your mouth, that's when you're putting yourself at risk of academic integrity breaches. So getting full sentence rewrites or tone suggestions where it's changing sections of work, that's when you're putting yourself at risk of things being detected as AI generated. And if you're going down the Grammarly Go path and getting things to be written completely from scratch, that means you're definitely putting yourself at risk of academic integrity breach. So we have a strategy, and Mr. Wilson's slides clearly showed that um, we have some tools available to detect this sort of stuff. And what was interesting is we showed those slides and even some more videos with more examples to students. It was a very eye-opening experience for them. It's part of our strategy as well. But while these tools are uh, a disincentive to inappropriate use AI, um, our goal is actually not to catch students. Our goal is to try and promote academic integrity amongst them through a combination of education and also effective assessment task design. And in our assessment task design this semester, we've got some new built-in routines that help students uh, produce their own work, helps them structure their time, and will help the students actually defend the authorship of their work if needed. Like I said, there is a 2% chance that this new tool produces a false positive. So we're trying to arm students with the, the capability to show that they've produced their own work if there is a chance of a false flag. And we've also got a robust, open and fair and consistent investigation strategies if we do detect uh, AI plagiarism. And we want to make sure there's a level playing field and justice for all with both our investigations and also our follow-up. So all of semester one this year, we started planning and piloting ideas. How are we going to manage the threat to academic integrity due to AI? And now we've got an, enacted a college-wide strategy for this semester. It involves education and information for the whole college community. It involves us testing our detection software tools against a range of different procedures. Establishment of assessment, effective assessment task design. Uh, routines for checking assessment tasks are written in an AI robust way and also updating our assessment policies and procedures and you might have seen some of these new policies and procedures on the documentation your children have taken home on the new assessment tasks. All these new policies and procedures are built around mandating and supporting students to apply strategies to help them verify and defend the authorship of their own work and therefore verify their own thinking and their own learning. <coughs> So in the interim, until we update our new assessment guidelines for 2024, we've added some new statements to the assessment task templates that students get. And they're built around the following ideas. First of all, it reminds students that using AI generative text puts them at risk of academic misconduct. It reminds them that ignorance of this is not a defence. It reminds them that when they submit work, they're acknowledging it's their own work and not AI generated. And finally, it reminds them it's their responsibility to keep and share drafts of their work to verify their authorship if needed. So what does that look like as far as the assessment process is concerned? I've got that on the screen just here. And as Mr Nichols said at the start of the speech, one thing we wanted to avoid was avoiding the risk of AI by making all assessment tasks in school in test conditions. We didn't want that because we didn't think that was in line with a well-rounded education and not in line with allowing students to demonstrate skill in a wide variety of settings and a wide variety of thinking skills. So we've got some new structures in place to, first of all, allow students to still do those take-home written and research task tasks while making sure they still have their in-class tasks and practical tasks, etc. But also, while they're doing that, to support students with these tasks to maintain their academic integrity and give them some tools to defend their authorship if needed. So the first step in this whole process for any take-home task, any research task, written task, on the very first day of the assessment, when the assessment is handed out, it's the student's job to make and share a Google Doc with their teacher. And the teachers have been supporting students with this process. From that point on, that document becomes a place where they do their assessment task. They do their drafting, their editing, and their completion of the assessment task on that document. And that becomes a record of their work. The second step for senior students is mandated that at some point in an assessment task is a mid-task check-in. This could just be something as simple as a, mid, a midway through the task, submit a draft to the teacher. It could be answering a question or a, a discussion post on a Canvas page. Now these two things, the drafting process and the midpoint check-in, they're not marked. They're not supposed to be onerous for the teacher or student. They're just a way that if needed and an investigation takes place, we can go back and check these checkpoints to see what was done in the generation and production of their final assessment task. And finally, on the day of submitting one of these take-home or research tasks, we have a validation component. The first step is students must submit their work via Turnitin because that's where our AI detection and plagiarism detection tools are. But in class, 
They'll do a small, in supervised conditions task, which checks their understanding. It's not supposed to be extra work or just an exam tacked upon the end of an assessment task. Most teachers have taken out part of their assessment task and made it the in-class validation component. It could be something as simple as, this, as one question. It could be a response, a reflection, and an opinion. The whole idea is to demonstrate the students have gained some learning by doing that assessment task. And once again, it's one more checkpoint if we need to, to go back and check have the students done their own work. And at the end of the process, we have our post-assessment strategies. The last step to maintain academic integrity is, also, is to use Turnitin, first of all, to check was it plagiarised and is there AI? But if Turnitin detects there is some sort of plagiarism taking place, that's just the start of an investigation process. Like we said, there's a 2% false positive chance. But at MacKillop, we run hundreds, if not thousands, of assessment tasks a year. So we are going to sometimes get these false positives. So we do make sure that before we start an investigation, we look at all the data we have. And that's where those three check-ins, the drafting process, the checkpoint and the validation become so useful because the teacher can go back and refer to them before they even start a conversation with the student to see if there's any cause for concern. And if there is some doubt, is this, if there is some cause for concern, we can start a pastoral and constructive conversation with the student to try and find out what happened. By the same token, the student can actually use those tools as their defence. They've got their Google Draft, they've got their check-in, they've got their validation, so they can actually use them to defend their authorship if they think they've been falsely accused as well. If an, academic, if an academic integrity breach is determined, there will be penalties. But it's also a chance for us to support the student to overcome the reason behind their breach. In the senior school, there's a strict protocol that must be followed, where there are clear guidelines for process and consequences, but also avenues for the student to seek second opinion through a school-based review and a board appeal. And Mr Wilson's prepared a video again to show one of the most amazing tools we have. It's called Google Draftback. It can be used by the students and the teachers, by the, the teachers to investigate potential breaches, but also the student to defend their authorship. So let's look at that video now. Okay, so this is a, a Google document that a student shared with the teacher, and the teacher was concerned that it might have been plagiarised. So they run it through what's called Draftback, and Draftback captures uh, letterpress by letterpress, keystroke by keystroke, everything that was done for the duration of the entire assessment task from start to finish. So it looks like here, this is very clear, this student has just been typing their work in. They said they've gone back and edited a few words, they've changed a few things, but keystroke by keystroke, the teacher can check, yet that looks like the student's work. However, a second assessment task, which the teachers thought was potentially plagiarised, all of a sudden we see whole paragraphs appear all at once in the assessment. And that means that there's no way a student could have typed those words in less than a second. And this is a flag that potentially there might have been an academic integrity breach here. So Google Draftback is a fantastic tool for us and also for students. Students to verify their authorship, to prove they typed their assessment task, but for teachers to check, we've already got a flag on Turnitin that maybe there was AI, maybe there was plagiarism. Let's go back now and look at the Google Draft to see what other evidence we can find. So what's next for AI and MacKillop? And it's probably time to address the elephant in the room. While this talk has been focused on academic integrity in the age of AI, what about McKillop's plans to use AI? Now at McKillop, we've got quite a few staff who are very keen to experiment with this technology. And I'm sure the same is true of our students as well. Lots of research has been done by the teachers here into the academic and educational uses of AI. And we've got teachers undertaking professional development in educational AI as well. We've also run some pilot tasks with select groups of senior students as well to see how we can integrate AI into the classroom and also into assessment tasks. We're taking things slowly. But for the short term, we're taking a considered approach to AI in learning at MacKillop. We believe this approach is justified as we await advice from the government and educational authorities who currently have what's called their draft national AI in schools framework out for consultation. And that consultation is available and open for people to give feedback on to the 16th of this month. In this framework, they've got six key elements, as you can see on the screen there, some of which actually raise some serious questions about bias, diversity, human rights, accessibility, privacy, security, and the well-being impacts of AI on children. And as part of our duty of care, we feel justified in taking a very careful and considered and robust approach to the use of AI in the college. We also feel confident that by establishing academic integrity as the bedrock upon which we build our AI strategy, will be well placed when the framework is finally released in its final form to adopt their recommendations as part of best practice teaching, ensuring that excellence in education remains at the heart of what we do at MacKillop. It's wonderful we've got such a community where parents are keen to come in on an evening 
and learn about how McKeel is looking about, thinking about and learning about academic integrity. So thank you so much for being here. We're blessed to have such a wonderful community. I understand if you need to leave now, now's the time. We'll have a Q&A in about a minute's time. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I haven't tested that myself, um, but even if you tell the AI model to write so it can't be detected, it's still constrained by its own essentially machine learning programming in some ways. It may be possible, it may not be, but at this stage we haven't seen that come up as a, as a consequence yet. But yeah, I haven't got the answer to that question. Once again, this, this space is growing rapidly, it's growing all the time. We're just trying to put some tools in place so we can, as best we can, maintain that academic integrity for the time being. But yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, look, that's a really good question because Turnitin is, is purely a text-based detection system. Um, but is, it, that was part of our discussion process in making this whole model. We found with the subjects that have video or um, audio or visual components, most of their assessment tasks are done in a process diary where the actual process is part of the actual assessment task itself. So for example, in visual arts, they have drafting work, they've got their initial sketches, there's a whole body of work that goes in before producing that final product. And if a student did happen to AI that final product, it's going to be very hard to match that with their original you know, process diary. And even if they did get away with that component, well, we can't, we can't solve every single problem either. We're just doing the best we can. But the bulk of their marks comes from the journey as opposed to the final product as well. But yeah, that's going to be a growing challenge as, as in the future. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to make sure that we can always value that learning journey. And so yeah, that with process diaries and stuff, and often things like music as well, the teacher's constantly working with the student all the way through their learning so they can actually see rather than having it as a record, they can actually see and they've actually been through the process with the student as well. I'm sure that students have thought of that as well. Um, it does take a lot of time to do that. And if someone really wants to go that far into breaking the system, well, we can't police everything. We, all we can do is put procedures in place to try and educate the students that actually your learning is valuable. And all that time you're putting into doing that it might have been better just to do the task itself. You might have learned something along the way. At the same time, too, we're actually finding that students who have been caught with using ChatGPT, for example, to write assessment tasks, they're not necessarily getting very good grades either. So their grade would have been relatively low before we even detected the AI. They're not actually doing themselves a favour either. So we're really trying to push the fact that your best learning and your best outcomes comes from doing the work. Yeah, but there's all, no matter what system we put in place, no matter how tight we try and make our restrictions, students will always find a way around it. We're just trying to make sure the easy path is actually the path that gives them the best learning. It does generate different, it can it generates very similar, in my experience, I'm not an AI expert either, in my experience it generates similar answers, but there'll be a unique answer every single time. But when we've done that, it picks it up, because what the Turnitin tool is checking, and I'm not an expert in AI either, it's checking the, the words, the, the sequence and combination of words it's put in. And so whenever an AI tool produces those words, there's a certain, I'm not sure if even pattern's the right word, but there's a certain way it produces text. Even if the text is different, it's still produced in a certain procedural sort of way. I probably didn't phrase it very well. When I say it was 100% chance or 0% chance, it's actually the percentage of that text block, which was potentially AI. So if they've written, say, 10 paragraphs, and one of those paragraphs was flagged as AI, that had come up as a 10%. So 10% of the task was AI. And when that happens, we treat it like any other case. So, um, for example, if that wasn't AI, but just a student had copied and pasted that paragraph into their assessment task, um, and assuming we've gone through the process and we looked at the draft back and we think the student had just done some AI work, what usually happens is we have a conversation with the student, we talk about what could have happened, and if it turns out that it was plagiarised, they had used AI, what happens is we mark the task assuming that paragraph wasn't even there. So depending on the severity of the case, if there's just one sentence in the whole assessment task which was flagged as AI, it doesn't matter. That's just, that just happens naturally. Some, sometimes a student will type a sequence of words that could have been typed by an AI bot. We don't have a, like a magic threshold of where we start taking things seriously, but as you can see from those patterns on the screen, I suppose, when you're seeing a whole paragraph as one colour or one block, that's usually a pretty, that's a, that's a danger sign that maybe that whole chunk can be taken out. But sometimes you see a student's assessment task where they're, oh, it might be 25%, but it's scattered all through the task. There's a couple of words here and a couple of words there. And sometimes students are going to type things just by chance that happen to also be on the internet or also could have been produced by AI. So we, take, we treat every case as its own unique case. Uh, we always talk to the student. We always look at all the data available and we try and make it as, as an informed decision as possible. 
And look, if we do get it wrong, like we said, there's the, the appeals process and reviews process as well. There's lots of layers the students can go through if they think they've been falsely accused. I'm personally very keen to start teaching students about how to use AI effectively. Um, and I think in the future that's something coming, but right now we're just, we're, like I said, we're taking it a bit cautiously to see what the government comes back with because what, our duty of care is our number one concern and our students' minds are growing and developing all the time. We've got to be very careful if we don't know exactly what tools are being used, what information they're getting and how their minds are being changed, how their thoughts are being changed, what information is being taken from the student where they're typing stuff in as well. So we want to make sure security and academic integrity are two pillars. But we do have staff doing PL right now on best use of education, sorry, best use of AI in education. So we'll be turning to them when the time comes, how can we start using this in our schooling? And I'm sure there's staff already using it for their own internal purposes. So I think we've got simmering behind the scenes some growing expertise in AI. We're just not quite ready to unleash it on the students just yet. But we're, I'm, I'm personally very excited about that opportunity in the future. Yeah. Um, I guess just as a kid, have it, someone has a kid in year 12 doing computer science, I know they've been using that to work backwards going, you know, design a program for this and then if you go to chat with GPT you can go, alright, well this is what, these are the sorts of things that come up and working backwards that way which um, has been used as a teaching tool in that regard and they found really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can't speak personally for them, but I imagine it's like any situation where you've got um, you know, the two companies, the AI tools are getting better, and so their business model requires them detecting AI. So I'm assuming they're paying a lot of people a lot of money to try and find new tools to detect AI, and it's just going to be an ongoing, but move away from that microphone, an ongoing battle backwards and forwards between the AI versus the detection tools. And all we can do is rely on what we've got available and just hope we keep selling that message that your learning is important, okay? You, that's, the journey you're going on is what really matters for the future and just trying all those different prongs coming together to try and produce it at a community where we uphold academic integrity, yeah. But I'm, once again, not a program, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but yeah, I'd love to know. I think we're pretty lucky at MacKillop that we have, over many years, developed a community, a, I suppose a culture where students value their learning. I'm not saying it's perfect, no, nothing ever will be. Um, I think at first there was a few eye rollings and groans when we said you've got to start putting your stuff through Google so we could check your learning and stuff, but um, there hasn't actually been much pushback at all. I think students have just accepted that, even, even students who would never use AI tools to cheat, they've accepted the fact that, well, this is the world we're living in right now and we've got to just go for this process. And I think some of them have also adopted on board the fact that, well, this is a good way that I can prove that I'm doing my own work as well. I haven't actually done the survey, but I think that survey of students would be a really good idea to do in the future as well. Right, well, the, the, the in-class should be something to do with the assignment. It should be, in, in theory, it should be related to stuff they've done in the assignment itself. It might not be like responding directly to the assignment itself, but it might be if you've done this assignment and you understand the content and the ideas behind the assignment, you should be able to answer this question. And it might not be a test question, it could just be your opinion. What was the most valuable part of the assessment task you did? Or reflect on what was the trickiest part of the assessment task. We're trying out, a, we're still learning ourselves. I'm, I'm not pretending we're experts. We're trying out a whole lot of different ways to do that validation process at the end. And we don't want to make it too big that, once again, it's double marking for the teachers. It's like a double assessment task for children. We're just trying to make it as small and succinct as possible. And with the validation task, plus the check-in, plus the drafting, plus their actual work, hopefully between all that data we can triangulate, has this student actually done the task and what have they learned in the whole process as well. But look, we value the feedback as well because we are learning, okay? This is a brand new space for teachers. It hit teachers at the end of last year, like it hit the whole world, and our whole world got turned upside down a bit. And what do we do? Our assessment task is pretty much our bread and butter because we could pretty much guarantee that what a student produced in assessment was pretty much their own work, and now we've got this new paradigm to work in where there's a whole lot of new challenges. But yeah, we, this is the best model we've found so far, but just like AI is evolving, I'm sure this model we got with the check-ins and stuff will evaluate, will evolve over time as well. Uh, so we've had turned in for a number of years for just checking the plagiarism against text on the internet. That's been used for quite a while. In first semester, we started our pilot process, and part of that was testing out these new AI tools. It wasn't available from the very start of a semester. I think it came available halfway through last semester, and um, it did pick up a few situations where students may have plagiarised by using AI, and that started that whole process. It started the conversation, it started the investigation. So, and from that, we obviously we made some mistakes in the process, and we learned from that as well, and that's what led to our current model of using the AI detection tools as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, so out of the three, the three check-in components, the drafting and the midpoint check-in, those two don't contribute to their mark and they are only checked if there's an investigation. The validation is, we decided as a college to make that part of their marks. Um, and this was debated in the staff room, whether it should be or shouldn't be. At the end of the day, we said it should be because it is part of the assessment task and students who do well do deserve to be validated and get some recognition and reward for the hard work they've done in their validation task. It also sent a message to the community that we, we take this seriously. This validation, yes, we're just checking AI with it, but it's actually a valid part of the assessment task. And what some teachers have done is they've taken an old assessment task, which had a few components. This component was testing a particular skill or outcome we wanted to test. We're just going to make that small part part of the validation. So it's still, it's still part of the assessment process. It still meets some of the outcomes they've got to meet, but it's just done in a classroom setting as well. Well, I can't, I can't say that we've got everything 100% right, but we did spend a, a P1, one of our first days this semester, our PL day, half of it was dedicated to some school processes, and we had a whole session on teaching teachers how to set up Google Docs and Google Drafts in their classroom. So we did some professional learning with teachers to teach them, when you go into your classroom, this is the way you set up your Google Docs. Uh, all teachers have been instructed to help students. We don't want that setting up the drafting process to be the thing that causes the barrier to a student. Every student should be supported 100% through that drafting process. And if you find a situation where that hasn't happened, please let us know, we can support that student. I've been working closely with Inclusive Ed because the validation component has put a bit of a burden on them, I'm not gonna lie, because it's one more part of assessment which needs to be supported and assessed. But what we're finding is because it's only a small, a small chunk, it's not a whole lesson, it's like 10 minutes to 15 minutes, uh, they can actually then roster their, their staff on to support students in blocks across the whole class. So that student might not do the, the validation in the very first part of the assessment task like everyone else. They might be rostered onto a rolling basis to get their support done. We will never let a student not get their provisions and support. Uh, that's not our intention at all. Uh, but yeah, if you, any feedback you give us on how we can make that process better to support all students, we're more than keen to hear. Uh, we're in uh, week five now, so what we're actually seeing is the first assessment tasks are coming in now. Um, so the first set of validations were done, I think, last week, and the first set of assessments are coming in. So we haven't actually gathered any data from students yet. Uh, like I said over here, how students are responding, we will be doing some surveying of students to see how they're feeling and what, what responses they're getting. Um, we've tried our very best to not increase the burden. If there's extra validation in class, it means the task for the take home should have been a little bit smaller. And, we, and look, teachers as well, teachers don't want to mark extra work if they don't have to. So they're try, we're trying to make sure that we're balanced on both sides. We're making sure that tasks just don't get artificially bigger to compensate for AI. We're trying to make sure that the same tasks they always were just maybe structured in a slightly different way. Um, look, that it depends on the year group and depends on the provisions. We do follow each student's um, uh, personalised plan and academic provisions wherever possible. So if a student has a provision, like for example, for extra time in in-class tasks, that applies to the validation task as well. If they're allowed a reader or a writer, that applies to the validation task as well. But it is part of the assessment task and that's set out at the start of the assessment task. Yep. And so if there's provisions in place, they'll be applied to that part of the assessment task. Uh, in the senior school, we've got to be very careful. We can't give a, a difference in playing field based on, I suppose, personal judgment. We've got to go by what the rules and regulations are for that particular student and their provisions and also the border studies as well. But the existing provisions will make sure they get those provisions. Yeah. We've just been talking with that with staff today because we're, we're currently going through a change of our um, internal processes as well. Uh, it depends on whether it's seven to 10 or 11 to 12. So in the seven to 10 school, uh, if we think a student has plagiarised or breached academic integrity, we have a conversation with a student, we gather the facts and parents are always notified with us. If a student has give, been given a penalty for an assessment task and lost some marks or they lost marks for a certain component because it's been picked up, parents will always be notified. Whether it could be a phone call or it could be an email. Uh, in the senior school, there are actually very strict rules about how that happens. So if we suspect plagiarism in the senior school, uh, step one, we have to do our investigation. Step two, there's a mandatory conversation between the student, uh, the teacher and the coordinator of that subject. Um, the result of that conversation um, is then documented in a formal letter, a plagiarism letter, where we spell out, according to the Board of Studies guidelines, uh, what category of breach it was, whether it was a first or second offence, and there's a whole criteria of consequences we can apply depending on the level of breach according to the Board of Studies, and we'll notify you exactly that level of breach. And usually that's done in negotiation with the student, and by that time we've had the conversation, 
most of the time the student accepts if they've made a mistake and accepts the level of punishment. We're trying to be very fair with our punishments as well. I shouldn't say punishments, the consequences as well. And that's documented for the parents and for the student as well. And if they disagree with the penalty or they think it's too harsh and they're not, they're not sure about the investigation, there's a teacher review. They can re request a formal review with their teacher. Then they can request a formal review with their coordinator. Then they can re request a formal review with the school executive, essentially. And if they're still not satisfied, they can re request an appeal with the board of studies. So there's many, many layers of communication that can happen. But we always make sure parents are informed. So in all cases, across all age groups? Yeah, well, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Look, I can't promise it's always been perfect because nothing's ever perfect. But the, the idea in our policies are that if a penalty is put in place, parents will be notified because parents are part of this learning process too. If a student's um, broken academic integrity, it means they've affected their learning and parents are part of that learning journey as well. If, say, for example, I had an AI flag in one of my students' assessment tasks, I was suspicious, so I went back to their draft and checked their draft and thought, oh, no, that seems pretty legitimate, I wouldn't tell anyone about it. It's just one of those things that happens. But it, when it gets to the point where I think it's valid having a conversation with a student, that's when the parents would be involved as well. I suppose it comes down to what the actual assessment task is assessing. If that's just illustrating a part of their story, it's not actually effectively what they're being assessed on, their, their writing and their punctuation in English, if it's just an illustration, I don't see a harm in, in that, um, if that's not directly what they're being assessed on, as opposed to, like you say, make an AI image of a cat and a pumpkin versus a Google search image. As long as they've referenced their source of their information and they've done that, I personally don't see a problem with that, but that's one of those fine lines. I'm not sure we've actually got to that sort of level in our processing yet. Like even on this slide here, like these two pictures had essentially the same idea, it was academic integrity versus artificial intelligence, and one was made by our team, media team here, and that top one, it clearly has the voice. You can look at that and you say, that's, that's McKillop's voice. That's, what, that's part of our publication. This one down here does the same job, but it's not in the same voice as McKillop. It's not McKillop's style. And that's what we're trying to stress to students. And when you do your own work, you're developing your own voice and your own style. Uh, for written take-home tasks, yes. Look, not all, and also, I should stress, not all assessment tasks are written take-home assessment tasks. There's lots of science, practical tasks, technology tasks. Yeah, where this doesn't happen. But if it's as soon as they have a written component that's you know more than, say, a couple of sentences, I suppose, that's when we it requires students to submit it through Turnitin and the detection to take place. The detection, though, is not perfect. If the text is less than a certain number of words, like one sentence or one paragraph, its reliability goes out the window. It's really designed for testing essays and reports and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, look, no, you, we don't look for zero. Look, we don't look for zero percent. And you're right. When it comes to a science task, for example, and they're writing a science report, every kid's going to have aim, hypothesis, so that stuff. Well, this has been done before. So we, we know there's going to be those behind low level similarities all the way across. What we're really looking for is not just the number but the pattern of where those plagiarisms are coming from. If it's a whole paragraph, if it's two whole paragraphs, if it's every second word, which means the kid's gone through and copied and pasted and just gone through and changed every second word. We're looking at a lot of patterns rather than just pure numbers. We've had students, or we've tested, I should say, we've tested writing science-style reports, and it can generate science-style reports as well, but it still gets flagged as, yeah, this, this, this way this text is generated looks like an AI-generated text. Okay, well, that's a good question. As students, we actually encourage students to use it. So there's two levels of Turnitin. At the student level, they can paste their work into their early, for example, and they'll get feedback on their, their writing style, their fluency, their grammar. It actually is a really good tool for students to use to give feedback on their learning. It also flags if they've accidentally copied and pasted a whole paragraph, it will show them actually this paragraph looks exactly the same as your friend Fred's paragraph over there, better fix it up sort of thing. But the actual AI component is not available to students right now. It's only available if you've got a corporate license for the whole program. Yeah, look, Mr. Mr. Wilson is unfortunately he's our digital learning coordinator. He's the one who's doing a lot, doing a lot of the testing behind the scenes. He's regularly checking all the new AI tools that come on the market, the common ones. He gets a subscription, tests them, downloads them, and stuff. And look, we also hear things through the grapevine, little whispers from the kids that someone's tried this or someone's done that, and that gives us an incentive to go and have a look at those things as well. You know, and so yeah. Look, um, that's, that's one of those little grey areas right now. Just to make it a blanket rule, we basically said that students should be using AI generative text for their assessment tasks. Okay, we've tried to leave it there. We don't want to encourage students to or to not use it for whatever reasons. Uh, look, I've heard conversations with the program students, like you said, they had to write an essay, they wanted some ideas, they might have used ChatGP to generate some ideas, but then they've gone and done their own research. 
In my mind, that means that it's like looking at any other resource to find information. One of the steps moving forward is like us, universities like Monash, and I think it's the University of Queensland has some really good tools available for how they're teaching their students. If you've used AI to generate ideas, here's how you reference that. So you're acknowledging the fact that even though the final work is mine, I actually got some ideas from AI. So look, leading forward, once we get that tick of approval from the government, they're the sort of things we're going to roll in as well. Not just how to use AI in the classroom, but how do students reference and acknowledge the fact that they used AI as well. There's no rules that I've seen so far that say what you can do in the background, what you can't do. Because if we, tr and if we tried to make that, if we told the community that uh, AI is banned, you're not allowed to use any AI at all, we could make those rules to our heart's content. But whether we can police them or enforce them, that's just, I don't think we, I don't even want to go into that space because we can't, we can't deal with that. All we can deal with when you submit your work, we want you to submit it so it's your own work, it's your own learning, your own thinking, and the work you submit is the one, the one you produced. And like those universities in the tertiary level, they've actually got policies in place I think they recognise that across their students, students will be using these tools. So let's just put some rules in place for how you acknowledge you've used those tools. And that might be where we're going in the future, but we're still waiting on advice before we go there. Look, well, thank you so much for the questions. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for all your, your thoughts, your ideas. Um, we'll take them on board as we move forward. If you've got any more, just one-on-one -on -one sort of questions, we'll be around for a little bit longer this evening. But Thank you so much for your time. Like I said, we're a blessed community to have so many parents and family and friends here to learn more about how we do things at McKillop. Thanks so much for your time this evening. Thank you.